Sword Online Last Collection is right around the corner and we got a glorious opening sequence animated by A1 Studios. We made a deal in the last video, you give me 150 likes and I'll do an opening explained video. You delivered your part, now it's my turn. Welcome SAO survivors, it's me GamerTurk and this is Sword Online Explained featuring the opening of Last Recollection. Now if you're new to my channel, what I do here in explained videos is to dive into the source material to give you all the possible information. Usually it's a task that requires a lot of due diligence and dedication, but technically is easy in its nature. Look into the source material and bring that knowledge out to the people. With non-canon material, there is no source material to fall back into, so <laughs> this explained is more about bringing the information together we have from previous games, trailers and the very limited info we have from the free demo for the game as well as, you know, in general underworld lore and then try to gauge a reasonable estimate of what we're up against in Last Year Collection. But before we cast away the Sly Foxes spreading misinformation, we have a look into the space. Honkai Star Rail is a space fantasy RPG by Hoyoverse, the makers of Genshin Impact. It is free to play on PC and mobile with cross-platform support so that you can enjoy it whenever, wherever. Join other players on this epic space adventure with the recently released version 1.3 featuring the epilogue of the Xianzo Luofu story as well as a brand new version of the fan favorite simulated universe, a roguelike gameplay mode. Joining the cast of more than 20 charming and unique characters are the new limited 5 star characters Imbibiter Lunei and Fu Xuan. Imbibiter Lunei is an elegant gentleman who has mastered the ability to manipulate water and life a silent yet sophisticated teenager embodying the features of his dragon bloodline. Wreak havoc with his imaginary type DPS character using his water manipulation abilities and destroy your enemies. Whereas Fu Xuan is a supportive character who protects her teammates. Head of the Divination Commission, this young woman dreams of one day being promoted as the general of the Luofu. Don't get the wrong idea from her slender and young appearance as her abilities allow her to reduce damage taken for her team and even take some of the damage onto herself as the excellent damage reducing support character. In the recent update you'll go through the epilogue of the Xianzo storyline and learn more about the characters alongside a new version of the roguelike simulated universe to take on as a challenge. Download now using the link down in the description to join the space adventure. 10 free warps are waiting for you in game and you can use these codes for 50 stellar jade each alongside the arrivals of Imbibitor Lunei and Fu Xuan. Alright now, where were we? Oh yeah, casting away the Sly Foxes spreading misinformation and get on with Sword Online Explained. As I mentioned in the final news video about Last Year Collection, the opening is very much focused on Dorothy, our new character for the game. We open up with her sitting under a dry tree in the Dark Territory, reminiscing sadly about Sarai, a little girl from Shasta and Lipia's orphanage that has close ties with her, and Kainan, a member of the Commerce Guild of the Dark Territory, as if she's mourning for them, with Kirito being the gentle support that wakes her up and shakes her own world, with the scene of Dorothy falling down with Sarai that is a very literal as well as a nicely tied figurative shot, so how about we start with that one? The initial shots of Sarai and Kainan, yes, they are quite ominous, and if this wasn't the SAO game worse, I'd likely see this as a potential flag for their eventual demise. But in the SEO game verse, we usually don't see deaths for the hero side characters, except for one that we'll get to later in the video, but as a general rule of thumb, you just survived compared to the main canon, we literally saved everyone in B.O.B. back in Fatal Bullet no matter how inconsequential they were. Medina who sacrificed herself the same way Yuju did in the main series literally got revived in a new body. If anything, ally characters dying is a very unlikely scenario. We, of course, had the Wayfarer girl that Medina ordered her to be her friend and it was later revealed that Wayfarers were just copies of other VRMMORPG players so no real deaths occurred anyways on that front. Kainan had some troubling scenes in the trailers too, talking to Kirito about how they betrayed them, which we'll get back to in a second, but even still I see it as unlikely with an asterisk because we'll get back to it in a second <laughs> but the shot with Kirito reflecting in Dorothy's eyes I find that shot absolutely beautiful and how it portrays exactly what Yujo saw in Kirito and uttered in his dying breath in the main canon. Envelop this world 
as gently as the night sky. This shot here was clearly inspired by that line with that gentle friendly smile ready to help whatever it takes and we'll get back to that shortly as well. And that's what we have in the next shot. It is quite the literal shot with Dorothy being attacked and falling down while protecting Sarai around the Eastern Gate region where the war preparations are happening. But it's not just a literal shot, it has a double meaning with a figurative one as well. Kirito. We all know at what price his help comes. It's always easy and comfortable living a lie it is filled with sweat and tears to live one true to yourself. When Kirito arrived in Underworld and helped Yujiro, he ripped him away from his comfortable life, journey to the central cathedral through endless hardships, overthrew the administrator through pain, suffering and loss, in addition to Yujiro himself losing his life in the main canon no less, but it allowed Yujiro to follow his goals and dreams, to have a purpose, to be true to himself, to be able to say, I did the right thing, I did all I could. It's exactly why one of the most emotional moments of the arc took place very early on with Yujo giving in to his tears, telling Kirito how much he waited for him for someone to give him a push out of that misery. Kirito shook Alice's life exactly the same, exposing the truth behind the Axiom Church, the truth behind her vague dreams of a sister, of the life she once had before becoming a puppet. The cost? She spent months upon months in an existential crisis, spent in pain with the knowledge of the fact that she was occupying the body of someone else and whether she is a mere puppet of a higher will or not. That is the price of truth, of stepping out of that comfort zone filled with lies. And Dorothy is someone who convinced herself that she is the child of sin, in quotes specifically, whatever that is supposed to mean we do not know yet. She forbids herself from enjoying life or even getting close to people and it certainly feels like Kirito will be shaking Dorothy's life as well by challenging that idea, plunging her into that hard path so that she can have a life that she can be proud of. As she is falling down in the game cutscene, Dorothy mentions her life is flashing before her eyes, but I don't think the biblical imagery here has anything to do with that, or rather, it feels more like scenes of good versus evil being portrayed. Without any context, it's really impossible to say anything, you know, you can take it as the angels rushing in to help and save people in a grand war, Dorothy perhaps questioning what is good and what is evil, that chained kid looking a lot like Yuju actually, especially with the sword below shining blue in the light. Huh. Horned demons usually symbolizing Lucifer or whatever you're gonna call him and we're supposed to have a literal prince of hell on the side of evil as well as Gabriel Miller himself in the game, the sheer maniac, but again, the biblical stuff it could just be biblical visuals because they are dramatic, they can be anything, they can be nothing. Except, except for one. The girl carrying a flag, featuring one wing, that of an angel, and one wing, that of a demon. Did you ever wonder why the Lasty Collection logo, which features weapons of a wide variety of characters in the game, features a flag? All I'm gonna say is, I'm looking forward to the context of why Dorothy is the child of sin and what role he's going to play in this conflict between light and dark. Kirito rushing and looking around is a continuation of the previous symbolic shot and also flows into the next shot as well. We head into a scene of little Dorothy, the song lyrics echo in a question she had since her childhood. What's the difference between dying and the world ending as dying leads into the world ending for you and the rest of it within that context simply does not matter. She is however left alone with the answer her mother gives to that question that one's life is a legacy that is passed down through generations and that death is not the end of one's contribution to life. She then finds herself in turbulent waters. A lot of people in the SAO wiki have found this similar to the War of Underworld opening 2 where Kirito was plunged into the depths and while it is similar visually speaking on the surface level, I completely disagree it is the same symbolism. Back in War of Underworld it was all about Kirito being oppressed by his guilt, plummeting to the bottom of the water, literally drowning in that guilt. It was his own will to disappear that was being symbolized, that's why it had calm visuals despite the very dark symbolism of being oppressed. 
with Dorothy, that doesn't really seem to be the case. This is much more erratic, almost as if symbolizing events beyond Dorothy's control, throwing her off balance, weighing down on her as if she does not have the power to fight the waves herself, as in she does not have the power to alter her predestined fate no matter how much she wants to. The waves are shaping her path without her control, the same way her fate and circumstances shaped her life and will shape it further. It's the same symbol, visually speaking, but symbolizing a vastly different case. And going back to that, she is indeed a Dark Knight on the verge of War of Underworld in an era where the Dark God Vecta is about to awaken in the Dark Lands. It's only natural that she's succumbing to the waves that are much larger than her, but Kirito does not give up, he resists and he fights. And that's why he can shake the lives of these people to be who they truly want to be, you know, to not succumb to their supposed fates. And the explosion at the end of the scene symbolizes that, Dorothy's change. We know she's going to break the seal of the right eye, which is as literal of a symbol as making your own fate gets, but there may just be more than the seal itself. Her taboo to break is her view of herself as the child of fate after all, and Kirito will be helping her break from those shackles. Then we have the Rulit trio over here, standing with the human army and the Integrity Knights at the foot of the Great Eastern Gate. And then we get a shot of fresh breath of air waking Dorothy up as she shakes the hand of Kirito. People love taking all of these in a romantic way, but... Remember, Kirito was the one sent into this world as a real worlder to influence these people and that's exactly the visualization of it. Like it's it's so clear that I don't understand why people go to a completely different thing rather than what's clearly obvious. Kirito is simply a completely different perspective in this world and there's only so many times I can say how he basically shattered the world views of an underworlder before I start sounding like a broken record. But that's just it. Helping others shed away a life full of regret and weight on one's shoulders, replacing it with a new self-found purpose in life to chase. That's what happened with Yujo, that's what happened with Alice, that's what happened with a lot of the side characters, and that's what's happening here with Dorothy. And we can see it perfectly in the next shot. You know, it's not just Kirito, but the effect he has on others around him, with them walking in the streets of a dark territory city with Yujo, Sarai, Kainan, and Alice, but suddenly a new entity appears that threatens everything. The God of Darkness. Vecta appears alongside his right hand man, the Prince of Hell, Vasago himself. And this is followed by quite a literal bloodbath actually. <laughs> this shot I believe to be Kainan, a darker skin tone alongside the wrists of his short slash robe. This is very much matching his design. And that's the exception I was talking about at the beginning of this video. And not just that, but the betrayal accusation we heard in earlier trailers that was framed as if it was meant for Kirito or Dorothy, I think he's actually speaking to Pooh at this point, the master of exploiting others. I think at some point, Pooh takes Kainan by his side to play one of his good old tricks to Kirito and Ko that leads to Kainan getting killed as he is backstabbed by Pooh. This is followed by some system effects engulfing Dorothy, clearly she'd be furious at Kainan's demise and likely turns her sight towards Pooh. This could be her quote unquote breaking the seal of the right eye moment because you know she has to go against the orders of a superior Pooh or Vecta but the system effects, the system effect, I cannot be so sure. If that visual above her is used on purpose, I think this has to do with her child of sin aspect and is a moment of transformation for her. We saw those effects only on perfect weapon control usage or when Quinella healed herself using direct system commands rather than sacred arts, so the circular effects, they are quite iconic and unmistakable, again, if they are used on purpose. We get a glimpse of Alice being subdued, all the main SAO girls destroyed by the hands of Pooh, except for Shilika it seems. I talked about this one way early on since this visual was shown to us ages ago in a trailer, but this is clearly the moment where all five girls are thrown out 
and then return in their goddess forms instead. And then, as the chorus hits, we actually move on to the big action set pieces. We see Berkuli, Fanatio and Vixurul Shasta fighting against some huge dragon kaiju thing, which, just to put it out there, I would not be surprised if it's some super form of, of Vecta or a divine beast serving him. Don't tell me I'm being crazy here. Instead of Strea, we fought a mutated giant Pillow Strea in Hollow Fragment, a super angel form of Seven instead of normal Seven in Lost Song, some digital machine monstrosity controlled by Tia instead of regular Tia in Hollow Fragment, a huge doomsday boss instead of Itsuki in Fatal Bullet, and some stupid giant boss thing instead of Hashiri in, in, in Alsatian Liquorice. Gameverse has a tendency to turn human figures into big kaiju bosses for some reason, so don't think for a second that this is some random beast and do not be surprised when it turns out to be a human character that we actually know. It just happens way too often in the game series. Dorothy and Lipia are protecting Sarai alongside other Dark Knights, which makes me curious about how the War of Underworld portion will progress with Shasta being around. I still believe for a while the members of the Dark Territory may follow Vecta, but at some point certain leaders will realize that Vecta is not an underworlder which will allow them to not follow his orders. We don't know the true extent of the law of power, you know, it's all about personal perception at the end of it, but considering the Darklanders do not bow to the much more powerful Integrity Knights or even Quinella's reign, Chances are, once they start seeing Gabriel Miller as an outsider, they may just regain their own control at some point, which is why even regular Dark Knights can go against the orders of Vecta. We then see the earlier trio of Shasta, Fanatu and Berkuli attacking the huge dragon, while Asuna is fighting Pooh in a different front, which Yuki comes in in her goddess Gladia form to save her. And for those wondering how Yuki will dive as a goddess if all the STLs are already occupied by the other girls, the Medicuboid, it is technically basically a proto-STL, so they probably made some alterations to make that one work. The real question, if you're gonna ask something similar, continues to remain though, if all STLs are occupied, how are Pooh and Vasago diving and clearly using incarnation? That remains to be seen. Nothing much to say about Kirito facing off Gabriel Miller in his Angel of Death form, but goddamn I love the amount of detail in this shot. Slow down the footage and you'll see that it's a quad attack on Gabriel. Kirito is attacking head on, while Alice is attacking from Gabriel's right flank, while Yujiro is attacking from right behind him. And if you continue to watch slowly, you first see Kirito being punched away, then Yujiro getting thrown back, and then Alice getting slammed into the rubble. But I said it's a quad attack, right? That's why I mentioned the positions at the beginning, because we also see Dorothy getting launched back, who presumably attacked from Gabrielle's left flank just off the camera. I really do love the shot of Alice lifting her up. After all, it is Alice who had once been in the exact same situation when the Rulit trio faced off Quinella on the 100th floor of the Central Cathedral. And while this shot is very nicely mirroring the War of Underworld opening 2 featuring Asuna and Alice looking up to Kirito, once again, it is slightly different than that when you look at its context. Conceptually, I find it to be much more similar to Alice's own situation against Quinella, that's why I mentioned that at the beginning. Her entire life turned out to be a lie, she found herself hopeless without any motivation or a reason to live, yet Kirito, with that gentle smile on his face, was always a source of hope to keep moving on. Unlike Asuna and Alice, who are beaten and are surprised by the existence of Kirito in War of Underworld opening, Alice here knows it is going to be alright and lifts up Dorothy to see the hope in Kirito's face instead, which flashes the earlier visual looping back to the beginning of the opening. In fact, that is indeed the exact same shot, Sarai chasing after Kirito and Yujiro, Kainan and Alice following right behind them, but now we see the full scene from the front view instead. I wouldn't usually call the flashback for such a small amount of time in between, but 40 seconds it is quite a long time in terms of opening, so I'll just say this is a beautiful callback that gives Dorothy the motivation to continue fighting. And with that, we also have the main series girls arriving in their goddess forms for one final group photo. And Medina is there as well, I guess. Uh, <laughs> this shot either could 
not have her at all, or at least have Rogue alongside them as things stand. Medina, she kinda just sticks out like a sore thumb with this crew. And then we see some more glimpses of Gabrielle's Angel of Death, but this beautiful, ferocious looking shot stands out to me the most. I do believe Gabrielle Miller will have a form after Angel of Death in this game, you know, I talked about <laughs> the finales of SAO Gameverse games a bit earlier in the video. And as you can see here, it looks like his Angel of Death aura is getting peeled off, peeled away, and we see a more human-shaped eye here instead, and then a single frame of his real eye, so maybe a new transformation may happen after this one. But following that little teaser, we got a beautiful scenic shot of Dorothy returning home and that pretty much covers the entire opening. If you have any questions, ask them down below, smash that like button like you smashed the previous one and in fact, check these videos on the screen if you haven't already, it helps them show up in YouTube recommendations, thus helping the channel immensely. A huge thanks to all my channel members and patrons and as always, stay cool.